All right, everybody. We are here. Amino acids. This is without a doubt my favorite topic to discuss in biochemistry because I feel like it's it's your true movement from say an organic class or your general chemistry classes classes um, into talking about specific biological molecules. And these are maybe the most important molecules that you'll encounter um, outside of, say, glucose. But these molecules are your building blocks for any sort of uh, large protein structure. Now, with that in mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can now begin this journey together. So, with all that said, amino acids. Amino acids are or an amino acid is a compound that contains both an amino group and a carboxyl group. Um, another way to look at this is just the same. You're supposed to be on the other screen. Just one second. Um, um, another way to look at and think about this is this carboxyl group. Think about that as your C. O, O, H, or your carboxylic acid. So when you hear the term amino acid, you're thinking about something with an amino group and an acidic group, hence amino acid. So you can deconstruct the name and think, okay, I gotta find an amino group on a molecule and an acidic group on a molecule. Now, what we are generally going to be talking about are alpha amino acids. Alpha amino acids are amino acids in which the amino group is on the carbon adjacent to a carboxyl group. So if you were to draw something like this, C, O, O, H, there's our carboxylic acid. Here's another carbon that is adjacent to a carboxyl group. Well, our amino group is going to be found on that right there, okay? So that's our basis for the term alpha amino acid. This carbon, therefore, that I'm going to put a star by is our alpha carbon. That's not a very well drawn alpha. That's a little bit better. Now, all proteins are composed of 20 standard amino acids. We're going to actually talk about a total of 22 of these amino acids. Um, so Bear with me. But if you look at this list right here, what you see are, are 20 standard amino acids. Now these common amino acids or these most frequently used amino acids and discussed amino acids are the ones that your friends are probably, you know, if anyone's ever told you, hey, when you take biochemistry, you're gonna to have to know the amino acid structures and the names and everything like that. They're talking about these. These are also known as a term that I like to use most often is our Protein ogenic amino acids. And I like to use that term due to the fact that, well, not every single amino acid is going to be used to build a protein. However, these 20 right here absolutely are. Do they have uses outside of protein synthesis? They certainly do. But there's also amino acids, and let's go back to that term, amino acid. There are also molecules that have an amino group and an acidic group that aren't involved in amino or in protein synthesis. Now, I do expect you to know the one-letter, three-letter codes, as well as the full name for uh, our amino acids. Here are, whenever you're looking at, you know, when you look at this long list right here and say, okay, where do I begin? My recommendation on where to begin with respect to learning these structures is to look at something like this. Now this table has selected a few amino acids. Specifically, it's selected lysine, arginine, histidine, aspartate or aspartic acid and glutam or glutamate or glutamic acid. So, the reason that these have been selected is because every single amino acid that you will look at will have at a pH of seven, 
the exact same backbone, which I'm circling right now. Every single amino acid at a pH of seven will have a deprotonated acidic group and a protonated amino group. So if you look at these backgrounds or backbones, they're all identical. What makes them different, however, is the is the side chains that come off of this. Now, if you look at these side chains, one of the things that I want you to notice about lysine, arginine, and histidine is what do they all have that's common? They all have a positive charge. So at a pH of seven, these three amino acids, lysine, arginine, and histine, will all have these side chains that have a positive charge. Now, aspartic acid and glutamic acid, on the other hand, what do they all have? Those two amino acids have negative charges. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to get into these different structures in just a moment. But when you look at this list right here and say, where do I start? Well, what I would recommend is start by learning the structures, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, histidine, lysine, and, uh, and sorry, arginine, those five amino acids. Learn those five three-letter codes and one-letter codes and full names because those are unique. Those are the only amino acids that we will ever encounter that have positively charged and negatively charged side chains. Now, of course, it depends on the pH of the solution that these molecules are in, but that's a good starting place. Now, two amino acids can come together in what is known as a condensation reaction to form a dipeptide. This new bond is called a peptide bond. So if we look at this molecule right here and this molecule right here, what you'll notice is that we have our carboxylic acid on both of these molecules. Our carboxylic acid right here. And that carboxylic acid is going to react with the amino group on, the, or on an adjacent molecule. And we're going to release H2O. So I'd like to draw a plus sign by each of my alpha carbons. And off each of those alpha carbons, we have our R groups. When these two react, we release H2O, we form a peptide bond. And here, what we have is a molecule. Like that, a molecule that has um, two unique R groups coming off of it. So peptide bonds are the links that come between two amino acids. They are a reaction, they are a condensation reaction between a carboxylic acid group and an amino group. Now, when we classify our amino acids, so again, thinking about how do we classify or how do I take that list of 20 amino acids and make more sense of it? Well, all the amino acids are going to contain an alpha amino group and an alpha carboxyl group. What's different between them is that R group. We already saw that a little bit when we looked at these five amino acids. Those letters in red are the R, constitute the R group for each of, uh, of these. So the R group is what's going to set every single amino acid apart from one another. Now the side chain of these or the R group, so that term side chain R group or side chain and R group, those terms are interchangeable with one another. Now, That side chain is going to determine the structural range and general physical characteristics of the amino acids. The amino acids are generally grouped according to the various characteristics of their R groups. They are classified based on things that we classify molecules as. Is this R group polar or nonpolar? There are nonpolar amino acids. So what do you think their R groups are? Lots of hydrocarbons. There are polar amino acids, hydrophilic amino acids, 
Well, how are those going to be classified? Or what are they going to look like? They're going to have unshared electrons. They're going to have a positive charge or a negative charge. Now, those polar amino acids can be broken down into whether or not they are charged amino acids, positively, sorry, whether they are uncharged, whether they are positively charged or negatively charged, specifically at a physiological pH or a pH of seven. Now, these different side chains, these different R groups are going to be our means for classifying. Um, and they're going to give us a lot of information how they will interact with their surroundings, how they'll interact with one another. Is a side chain polar or is it nonpolar? Polar side chains will form favorable interactions with water and each other. Hydrophilic interactions like hydrogen bonds, ion, Ionic interactions as well as dipole interactions are quite common in all of these. Now, nonpolar interactions, on the other hand, so think water fearing or hydrophobic groups, they're going to interact with each other and they're going to kind of repel water from one another. In addition to repelling water, they're also going to repel polar side chains. So we have hydrophobic interactions taking place there. So the first set of molecules that I wanna get into is this big group right here. So if you, if you think, how can I classify my amino acids? You're going to classify them as nonpolar or polar uncharged, polar positively charged, or polar negatively charged. So four big groups there. The first big group is are nonpolar amino acids. Those nonpolar amino acids are glycine, alanine, proline, valine, leucine, isoleucine, and methionine. These will form hydrophobic interactions. So if you look at proline, for instance, proline is a very unique structured amino acid. This is a five-membered ring, but one of the things that should stand out to you is I'm going to underline my alpha carbon. So my alpha carbon for proline goes to CH2, which goes to CH2, which goes to CH2, which goes to a, uh-oh, it goes back to the N termini or the amino group of my amino acid. So we have this five-membered ring and two of the atoms, a nitrogen and my alpha carbon are a part of my amino acid backbone. If you compare that to, and so effectively, what this group has, the amine, or sorry, the atoms that make up my side chain are hydrocarbons. It's just CH2. So what do we know about CH2 and its interaction with water? It's not a particularly favorable interaction. So if you think about proline, valine, isoleucine, leucine, and alanine, those are all hydrocarbon-based R groups. So they don't really want to interact. So these will not, all of these side chains will not form hydrogen bonds. They will not participate in ionic or dipole interactions. And basically what they want to do is they want to associate with other hydrophobic groups. So alanine would love to interact with valine. Valine would love to interact with proline. All of these nonpolar amino acids they're going to want to interact with one another and they're not going to want to interact with water and they're not going to want to interact with other types of amino acids. So the person who is responsible actually, and this is an important uh, piece of information, the person who's responsible for the single letter codes of our amino acids is a woman by the name of Margaret Oakley Dayhoff. Margaret Oakley Dayhoff was a um, bioinformatician in like the 1950s or as early as the 1950s. And she had to come up with a, a way of processing protein sequences very quickly. And writing out the full name became very, uh, uh, I like this word, onerous. And so what she said was, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna give single letter codes. So glycine was G, alanine was A. Proline, P, valine, V, methionine, M, isoleucine, I, leucine, L. 
Okay. So for these nonpolar amino acids, the first letter happens to be the single letter for every single one of them. Okay. She also helped devise the three letter code GLY for glycine, ALA for alanine, PRO for proline, VAL for valine, MET for methionine, LEU for leucine, and then I. L-E for isoleucine. So you need to know those one and three letter codes. And you also need to know that Margaret Oakley Dayhoff was responsible for coming up with this system. And this system is huge and it's significant if you're processing huge amounts of data and huge amounts of protein sequences. So, yeah. Um, and you're not going to be expected to draw anything on this exam or these exams, but I think that for the purposes of organizing, I personally don't like drawing skeleton structures. And instead I like to write out and draw all my atoms. I think that's the best way to make sure that you're using the right number of carbons in a chain. Okay. The next group of molecules and another way of classifying molecules is we can classify amino acids based on whether or not they're aromatic. You have a total of three amino acids that are amino uh, that are aromatic amino acids. Phenylalanine is actually also polar or nonpolar. Sorry. Despite it being aromatic, it's also nonpolar. So it can be both of those things. Sure. Tyrosine is one of your other aromatic amino acids, and it would be classified as polar. Tryptophan is your third and final aromatic, and it is also nonpolar. So NP. So we've got tyrosine, which is polar, tryptophan, which is nonpolar, and phenylalanine, which is also nonpolar. Now, the significance of these amino acids is that tyrosine and tryptophan are both amino acids that will absorb light in the UV spectrum. So they will absorb light at about 260 and 280 nanometers. Now, you might think, okay, what's the point of that? Or what, what value is that? Well, if you're looking at and trying to purify a protein, and that protein, let's say... Um, has tryptophan. If it has this tryptophan structure, here's my tryptophan. And you shoot light at this protein sample, and that light has a wavelength of 280 nanometers, you're going to get a notification, or you're going to have... So these two amino acids will give you a sense of whether or not a sample has a protein in it because if a protein has tryptophan or phenylalanine, it will absorb light at about 280 nanometers, and that absorbance will indicate yes, indeed, there is protein. So tyrosine can also be classified as aromatic, but it is a pol or it is a polar amino acid. We haven't gotten into non-charged versus charged, but this happens to be a polar non-charged. So its classification is polar aromatic, and it is not charged. Now, like I said, UV light absorption is very important part and why we care about these two amino acids in particular. The single letter codes for these amino acids, phenylalanine is F, tyrosine is Y, let me erase some of my writing, and tryptophan is W. So these are kind of tricky. Um, and one question that folks have asked me in the past is where do these letters come from? Um, and sometimes it is simply the first letter, but that's not always the case. Uh, for instance, we have proline and we have phenylalanine. Proline takes the P, phenylalanine F, Y, F. And you might be thinking, oh, well, I know that whenever I was a little kid and I was trying to spell the word phone, I spelled it F-O-N-E. You did that because of phonics. 
And that is where this is coming from. The phonetic pronunciation of some of these words is where their single letter code comes from. Fetal alanine, F, the phonetic representation or the phonetic uh, pronunciation would be using F. And that's where that comes from. Tyrosine and tryptophan, those are just, those are also the phonetic kind of uh, derivations. Ty, y, y, that Y in tyrosine, that's where it's coming from. In tryptophan, um, there's one of the, the mnemonics or one of the suggestions that I always received was um, this bicyclic ring structure. You can make a W. And that's maybe where you can kind of give yourself that little clue to remember this. I think that tryptophan might have simply come from availability of letters, availability of single letters, and something that looks similar to. So um, okay. So our next group of amino acids is now we're getting into the polar amino acids. We have polar amino acids that are uncharged. So that means that at a pH of 7.4, these don't have a charge. But also, these are not going to have a charge at a pH of 1. They're not going to have a charge at a pH of 2 or anything like that. These are basically going to have no charge across the pH gradient. So all of these groups have some, they, they do have some uh, electronegativity or atoms that are electronegative that will give a pole, that will give a partial charge, but it's never going to be strong enough to adopt a formal charge. Now, if you look at some of these, serine and threonine, both of those have hydroxyl groups. Cysteine is an amino acid that, in my opinion, looks very similar to serine. The only difference is that, one, the way that it's represented. The only difference, though, is we have a hydroxyl group versus a sulfhydryl group in cysteine. Um, so I think this is very helpful, or this is the sort of thing that is very helpful when you're trying to learn these structures, trying to, um, identify what groups and identify, um, basically similarities between the, or sorry, similarities between the groups so that you can say, okay, well, I know that there is a CH2 coming off of that alpha carbon. What else do I have? Um, I think that's very helpful. So I always kind of think of cysteine and serine as being very similar. Sulfhydryl group versus a hydroxyl group. Now, asparagine and glutamine, those two have this kind of funky group over here. Part of it looks like a hydroxyl, or it looks like a carboxyl group because we've got the carbonyl carbon, but then we have NH2 coming off of it. Now, this is going to ultimately be resonant stabilized. It's never going to adopt a formal charge, hence why these amino acids are one of the other reasons these amino acids are classified as polar uncharged. These amino acids are going to love participating in hydrogen bonds. If you look down at serine, for instance, with that hydroxyl group, you got lone pairs of electrons. If you look at asparagine, one, two, one, two, lone pairs of electrons. You've got a lone pair of electrons on that NH2 as well. So you've got lots of lone pairs of electrons. So that means that lots of these groups can act as hydrogen bond um, acceptors. But then if you look at serine, threonine, and cysteine, well, those also have a hydrogen. And uh, in the case of serine and threonine, they can act as hydrogen bond donors. Um, these will not form ionic interactions and they are not going to participate in hydrogen bonds. Or, sorry, in hydrophobic interactions. So hydrogen bonds, yes. Ionic and hydrophobic, no. These single letter codes are S, T, C, N, and Q. Now, again, we're kind of looking at where are these coming for, from? Some of them, it's the first letter. Some of them, it's a phonetic pronunciation. There's a paper published in, I think, in 1963 that it provided basically the rules for why different amino acids had different single letter or three letter codes. The three letter codes for these, and I think I have to go back to the previous slide to fill in three letter codes, S-E-R, T-H-R, 
CYS, ASN, and GLN. Let me go back also to the previous slide. Our three letter codes for phenylalanine, PHE, tyrosine is TYR, and tryptophan is TRP. Our next group of amino acids are polar, again, polar, but positively charged. So these are polar charged, but specifically they have a positive charge at a pH of seven. Now, the different amino acids here, one of the things that's, sorry, just a second. Um, these are going to be amino acids that love forming ionic interactions. They can also be hydrogen bond donors, so they can participate in hydrogen bonding. Um, but more than likely, because they have that formal overall charge, they're going to like to take on a positive charge. And so they're going to like participating in ionic interactions. I think a good way to learn these is to simplify them. For instance, lysine, I write as this. And then arginine, I do the exact same thing, CH2, and then in parentheses, oh, two, well, in parentheses, put a three out there. And then I've got that kind of funky group out there. So, um, yeah, that's the types of interactions. These will not be hydrogen bond acceptors unless they're deprotonated. And that's going to be, or they're going to be deprotonated at a very high pH. So these are all protonated and have a positive charge. They're not gonna participate in hydro hydrophobic interactions since all of their bonds are polar. The single letter codes are lysine, arginine, and histidine. Three letter codes are LYS, ARG, and HIS. And this, so, okay, here's the tricky thing about the amino acid histidine. Um, histidine is kind of a weird one because the R group has a pKa of 6.1. If you remember the buffering range of a molecule, if it has a pKa of 6.1, then its buffering range is 7.1, 7.1, all the way down to 5.1. What that means is that if the pH of a solution is, let's say that it's 7. Point, let's say that it's 6.5. If the pH of a solution is 6.5, then the molecule histidine is going to have a positive charge and it's going to look like this both of the nitrogens are going to have protons. One of them will therefore have a total of four bonds coming off of it, so it's going to have a positive formal charge, okay? Now, if the pH is 7.4, well then, that proton's gone. And when that proton is gone, it doesn't have an overall charge. So when you look at this molecule right here, and you look at the different atoms, Nitrogen, for instance, that nitrogen that I just drew an underline to, it has one carbon nitrogen bond, another carbon nitrogen bond, and a nitrogen hydrogen bond. Nitrogen likes to have three bonds and a lone pair of electrons. Boom, boom. If you look at our other nitrogen, we've got one, then a double bond, so that's three bonds, and then it's also going to have a lone pair of electrons. So that nitrogen is going to have no overall charge to it at a pH of 7.4. But histidine is grouped as a positively charged amino acid because of the fact that near a physiological pH and at a pH of 7.0, there's at least some that has a positive charge. So I just want to, to be clear with that. So histidine at a pH of 7.4, may or may not be positively charged. It just depends, or there's going to be a mixture of that positive and neutral uh, form of the molecule and the concentrations will, will vary. 
Okay, so our last group of amino acids are polar and they are negatively charged. So they're polar, they are charged, but their charge is a negative. These are groups, aspartate and glutamate. These are going to have a negative charge at a pH of 7.4. And so what that means is that they are going to love participating in ionic interactions. They can also be hydrogen bond acceptors, but chances are, since they have those strong negative charges, they're going to have ionic interactions. These will not be hydrogen bond donors at a pH, or at a pH of 7.4, and they're also not going to participate in hydrophobic interactions. Their single letter codes are D and E. Now, when it comes to learning the structures aspartate and glutamate, one thing that I think is really helpful is to just think, okay, I've classified, or this is why I, I highly recommend biting off the, the, the piece of our five amino acids that are charged. I'm going to learn these five structures and go from there. Aspartic acid, glutamic acid. I always kind of like personify them and I say aspartic acid and glutamic acid are siblings. Glutamic acid is a little bit taller, which is why it has the additional CH2 there. But at the end of the day, they look similar to one another, which is why they both have carboxylate ions on their, their R group. Now, aspartic acid is CH2, then carboxylic acid. I like to think about, or I like to know aspartic acid and glutamic acid because that also helps me learn the structure of, or that I think is helpful for learning the structure of asparagine and glutamine. Asparagine, much like aspartic acid, is a single CH2 followed by a carbon with a carbonyl oxygen, but it has this ene, this amine on it. Glutamine is just like glutamic acid, but it has an amine coming off of my carbon, my, my terminal carbon. So, um, getting back to go. D and E. The three letter codes for these are ASPART or ASP and GLU. So I think that there's, if you look at the three letter codes, look at the structures, it's very helpful to find things that are similar about the molecules and differ about those different molecules. Um, and I think that's very productive because then you're not looking at a list of 20 or looking at a, a model of 20 different structures and saying, what do I do with this? And so then you can say, okay, well, aspartic acid or aspartate, if I know that, or if I know the structure of that, then I kind of know the structure of asparagine. If I know aspartate, then I also kind of know the structure of glutamate. And if I know glutamate, I kind of know glutamine. Um, and one thing that I like to do personally is whenever I'm drawing my R groups, I'm going to draw them like this. I'm going to scribble out the COO minus just so that I get a better visual of what an amino acid looks like at a specific pH, whether it's protonated or not. Okay, now moving ahead. Amino acids number 21 and 22. These are known as pyrolysine and selenocysteine. So these are derivatives of lysine and cysteine. Now, these are less common or they are considerably less common than the amino acids that we've previously talked about, our 20 proteinogenic amino acids. Here's cysteine and here's selenocysteine. The difference between cysteine and selenocysteine is that you have selenium introduced as opposed to sulfur. And if you look at the periodic table, selenium and sulfur are in the exact same grouping. So there's some, there's, that's one of the reasons that uh, selenium can substitute for sulfur. Pyrolysine, well, that is lysine, but what makes it a little different is this pyrrole group here at the end. Now, I always talk about these amino acids, number 21 and 22, not necessarily as afterthoughts, but kind of as supplements. Um, and I don't mean that in the nutritional supplement way, but I talk about them kind of as the, the, the last two. 
Um, because I want you to know the, the first 20 more so than I want you to know these last two. I think it's helpful to know what these two amino acids derive from, cysteine and lysine respectively, but that's pretty much it. I don't expect you to know the structure, certainly not of pyrrole lysine. Selenium, if you know cysteine, or sorry, cysteine, if you know cysteine structure, you kind of know selenocysteine structure. Now, we can look at every amino acid and give them basically a score of and a spectrum of hydrophobicity. How much do they want to interact with their aqueous environment? How much do they not? We have the highly hydrophobic amino acids, isoleucine, valine, leucine, phenylalanine. And then our less hydrophobics, we have cysteine all the way through tyrosine. And then at the, the opposite end of the spectrum, we have histidine all the way down to arginine. So this is basically a look at which amino acids, or you could also look at this as polarity, nonpolar to polar. So your most polar amino acids, arginine, lysine, those are both positively charged amino acids. Glutamine and asparagine are basically the same in terms of their polarity as um, your aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Histidine is also a polar amino acid. So we've got these seven amino acids that are the most polar amino acid, and they're either going to be positively charged or look very similar to a positively charged amino acid. Okay, so some of the unique characteristics of our different amino acids, glycine, if you remember, glycine has, and I'm just going to draw the alpha carbon and the R group. The R group is simply a hydrogen. This is a non, this is our only achiral amino acid. Every single other amino acid, the alpha carbon is a chiral carbon. That means that glycine is entirely too flexible. Proline is a cyclic amino acid and does not have a primary amine. This is an extremely rigid and not flexible structure, not flexible bond. Isoleucine and threonine have a total of two different chiral centers on their um, side chains. Cysteine, and this is the, of these four items, this is most important, second most important, third and fourth most important detail. Cysteine is an amino acid that is capable, it has these sulfhydryl groups, and those sulfhydryl groups can form what is known as a disulfide bond. A disulfide bond is found in cysteine, T-I-N-E, whereas cysteine is the individual amino acid. Now this disulfide bond is when two cysteine residues form a link between their R groups. That's significant because that's a covalent bond that covalent bond is going to completely ignore changes in pH. If the pH goes up, if it goes down, that disulfide bond is going to remain in place. So last but not least, asparagine and glutamine, well, they're just the amide forms of aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Asparagine and glutamine are easily hydro hydrolyzed to form aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So that's kind of what makes them unique and interesting. Okay, now the atoms of the side chain are assigned sequential letters in the Greek alphabet. So like we start with our alpha carbon, which is our carbon adjacent to our carboxyl carbon. We also have, depending on the length of that chain, we also have an, a beta, gamma, delta, and uh, I believe that's an epsilon uh, sequence of our, our letters. So if you've ever heard of... Uh, branch chain amino acids as like a nutritional supplement. Well, what they're referring to is amino acids that have a chain coming off of here. So something like this would be a branch chain amino acid, a beta branched amino acid. Uh, this is showing lysine and glutamic acid. Peptides, proteins, and nomenclature. Uh, individual amino acids are called amino acid residues once they incorporate it into a peptide. So amino acid residues are named by dropping the I-N-E suffix and adding Y-L, except for the very last amino acid. For instance, what this shows right here is a polypeptide read in the N-2 
to C direction, the amino terminal to the carboxyl terminal. If you look at the different side chains highlighted in red, you would see that this is a serine, this is an alanine, this is a tyrosine, a glycine, sorry, that backwards. This would be a glycine, followed by a tyrosine, followed by an alanine, followed by a valine. Now, the terminology would be, this is a cyril, glycyl, uh, tyrosyl, alanyl, so that makes all one word. And um, so that makes this molecule's name all one word. That's a pretty, it's, it's correct, it's accurate to use that terminology. But when you're talking about a peptide or a, a a peptide that's 35 amino acids or a protein that's 768 amino acids, it's kind of impractical to write the entire name out using that, that sort of terminology. Now, stereochemistry of amino acids. Except for glycine, the alpha carbon is attached to four different groups, substituent groups. And this, that makes that alpha carbon a chiral center. So the configuration about that alpha carbon is described and represented with the Fischer Convention. Now our L amino acids, unlike our sugars, so we use the L derivative or the L form of amino acids, whereas when we talk about sugars, we're talking about the D sugars. So here's alanine, D versus L alanine represented. Where is that amino group? It's on the left-hand side in L, and it's on the right-hand side for uh, our D amino acid. All amino acids derived from proteins have the L stereochemical configuration. Now, just to kind of rehash whenever we were talking about this, your priority group, um, sorry, your priority groups when we were looking at L versus D glyceraldehyde, where was the hydroxyl group? Where is the, um, sorry, where was the hydroxyl group? And in this case, our highest priority is going to be our carboxyl group, making our alpha carbon for two, two, three, three. So when you look at alanine, for instance, here's our R group, or sorry, this is our R group, this is our R group, and therefore this is the alpha hydrogen, the alpha hydrogen. Um, generally, whenever I draw an amino acid, I'm going to use something that looks a little bit more similar to this, where I'm going to draw an individual amino acid. That looks like that. So on the left-hand side is where I'm gonna put my NH3 because I draw my molecules in the N to C term, uh, N to C directionality. Okay. So spectroscopic properties, we already kind of talked about this previously with uh, molecules and their ability to be absorbed within UV light or by UV light. Um, only phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan are going to absorb that UV light. And that's at 280 nanometers. Yeah, sure, they'll absorb light at lower wavelengths, but really not quite as much. Every single amino acid absorbs light then in the infrared region, and basically no amino acids absorb light in the visible light spectrum. So when you're thinking about that electromagnetic spectrum where you think about the visible UV and IR spectrum, um, everything absorbs in the IR region. Uh, and so you don't use the IR region to give you a sense of um, presence of tyrosine or tryptophan and therefore presence of uh, 
of protein, but instead you use this UV of 280 nanometers to tell whether or not a protein is present in a solution. Now, I'm gonna kind of breeze through this. There are also non-standard amino acids. So these are unusual amino acids that can be very important um, because what they do is they kind of change the interaction that a, an amino acid has with other parts of it. For instance, phosphoserine here, this is going to put a phosphate group on where there was previously hydroxyl. What does that mean? Well. Phosphate, is a phosphate a different size than a hydrogen? It absolutely is. The significance of that, well, serine was capable of doing hydrogen bonding, whereas phosphoserine, that's capable of forming ionic interactions. What's the difference in strength between an ionic interaction and a hydrogen bond? Ionic interactions are stronger. Um, so there's tons of different non-standard amino acids. And generally these are going to, oopsies, the non-standard amino acids and proteins generally are resulting from a modification of an amino acid after it's been incorporated into the polypeptide strand. These are, since this is after, these are commonly known as post-translational modifications. Now, the reason that we're going, not going to dig too far into this, and this is the depth of how far we're going to dig into it, in fact, is that there's 300 or more non-steroid amino acids that have been found in cells. And different organisms are going to make different uh, non-standard amino acids. And as it turns out, many of these are not constituents of proteins. So there are also biologically ami active amino acids. Amino acids and their derivatives sometimes function in non-protein roles in cells. For instance, um, Histidine is the amino acid that is used to synthesize uh, histamine. So free histidine floating around in the cell can be metabolized into uh, histamine. Um, so, you know, if you have an allergic reaction to something, your body is going to take this free histidine, make a bunch of histamines. Um, you also have uh, dopamine and uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, which are precursors for different hormones um, and neurotransmitters. And these are things that you get into a little bit more whenever you take metabolism. So now let's talk about maybe one of the, the key parts of understanding amino acids. Amino acids are weak acids. One way that you can think about that is and classify are they weak acids or strong acids. Again, when you think about uh, strong acids, there's like seven of them. Weak acids. Well, everything that's not a strong acid is a weak acid. Weak acids are only going to partially dissociate. The Ka is the ionization constant for a weak acid. Ha is our, our weak acid. That would be our protonated acid in water. Ha will dissociate into H plus and A minus. Negative log Ka is our pKa. The smaller the pKa, the more acidic the weak acid. Now, a good way to think about this is if the pH is less than the pKa, if the pH of a solution is less than the pKa of a molecule, um, that solution is acidic. So you have a high concentration of hydrogen ions. And so the protonated form is going to predominate. Meanwhile, the opposite end of the spectrum. If the pH is higher than the pKa, the solution is less acidic. It's a more basic environment. So the deprotonated form predominates. And so there's only a handful of protons that are present in that solution, or there's a small number of protons that are present in that solution, and they might not all go to a specific uh, group, depending on the pKa. So ionizable groups in amino acids. Remember from our previous lecture, a monoprotic acid has one ionizable group. A diprotic acid has two ionizable protons and the triprotic acid has three ionizable protons. Every single amino acid has at least two groups. It's got the carboxylic acid and the amine. So every single amino acid is at very least a diprotic acid. Those with ionizable side chains, or R groups, have three. 
And remember, those five ionizable side chains are lysine, arginine, histine, glutamic acid, aspartic acid. None of the other ones. The only amino acids with three uh, that are listed here, or sorry, the only amino acids with three ionizable groups are either polar positive or polar negative. So deprotonation of a carboxyl group looks like this. That acidic group, so it's an acid whenever it has that hydrogen. It reacts with a base, water can act as a base, and it will form this conjugate base. So if we talked about CH3COOH, so that would be aspartic acid, that can break down into the conjugate base of that acid, which is going to be aspartate, or sorry, uh, Acetic acid would form the acetate ion, and then it's going to release a proton. 4.76 is the pKa, the average pKa of uh, an, a carboxyl group, an alpha carboxyl group is 2.2. The greater the acidity of the amino acid carboxyl group is due to the electron withdraw withdrawing inductive effect of NH3+. So most of your groups like this have a pKa of 2.2. If it's any higher or lower than that, it's going to be because of the inductive effect. So here would be some differences in that. If you have something like glycine, a simple amino acid, there's, no, there's nothing really on that alpha carbon to have any withdrawing effect. Whereas this guy over here, it's got a, a, an R group side chain, which is going to cause the pKa of our carboxyl group to go up. Now, pKa values, I will always give you those. But I do want you to know about the inductive effect and why something might have a different pKa, because I think that it's, it's valuable to make some sort of prediction and give yourself a a reason why something is the way that it is. So here are the pKa values. I'm gonna give you a chart basically the exact same as this. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to point out arginine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, histidine, lysine. There are two amino acids, depending on the pKa value chart that you find. You might find a side chain pKa for cysteine. You might find a pKa value for serine. And in this case, you might find one for tyrosine. Think about those R groups. Cysteine has a sulfhydryl group. Tyrosine has a hydroxyl group. Now, under certain conditions, sure, those groups can be deprotonated. But for our purposes, I'm going to get rid of these and I'm not going to treat those as ionizable because it's very rare that they get ionized because chances are cysteine, what it's doing is it's losing that proton as a part of formation of the disulfide bond. Serine and tyrosine, chances are they're losing those hydroxide groups as a part of forming a uh, phosphoserine or a phosphotyrosine. Those hydroxide groups basically get subbed out for OP3 2 minus. Now, the structure, so just as a group can be ionized or, or just, sorry, just as groups are ionizable, um, depending on the pH of the solution that they're in, they are going to be either protonated or they're going to be deprotonated. So at a low pH, all ionizable groups are going to be protonated and in some cases, that means they have a positive charge. And in other cases, that means they have uh, a neutral charge on their side chain. But let's keep in mind, if you have something like aspartic acid, for instance, and actually, yeah, aspartic acid. If we think about aspartic acid, it has, and this is the way that I like to draw amino acids just to keep them simple. doesn't give you too much information on the length of the chains, 
but I think that it's still a helpful model to use. So if we use that as the amino acid aspartic acid, that is what this molecule will look like when it is fully proteinated because the R group is a carboxylic acid and the side chain, or sorry, the R group, and then the, it has the termini of a carboxylic acid. The overall charge on this at the lowest possible pH, well, the carboxylic acids are going to have no charge whatsoever, leaving behind our amino group, which maintains a positive charge. So this overall charge is going to be positive one. Therefore, this is in its ionic form. Now, at a mid-range pH, you're going to have a zwitter ionic form that's going to dominate. And that molecule is going to have no net charge. At a high pH, basically every group is going to be deprotonated or unprotonated, in which case that molecule is going to adopt its ion anionic form. Now, if we look at, say, these two amino acids, we've got a histidine down at the bottom. And then up here, we've got alanine. Alanine has a total of two pKa's. When the pH is below 2.2, this is the form of the molecule that you see. When the pH is above 9.5, this is the predominant, let me clarify, predominant, the most common form of that molecule that you're going to see. In between those, you're going to have a molecule known as a zwitter ion. That's going to have both a negative charge and a positively charged group. Now, the, if we look at histidine, for instance, histidine at its lowest possible pH will help to charge. So I always like to ask the question, could an amino acid like alanine adopt a plus two charge? Well, no, because this model right up here at the top, model A, shows you the three different forms that alanine can take on. Histidine can have a positive two charge because it's got its amino group as well as our R group campus charge. Now, histidine has a total of three pKa's for the different groups. It's got one at 2.2, another at 6.0, and then another at 9.5. So at a pH of 1.0, this is what, um, the most common form of histidine will look like at a pH of 3.5. As an example, this is what the molecule is going to look like. This right here is going to be the most common form of the molecule from the pH above. If the pH is greater than 2.2, but less than this next pKa of 6.0. This the most common form of histidine, or sorry, histidine with an overall charge of zero will be the most common form of the molecule so long as the pH is greater than six and less than 9.5. So that's what you should expect from these different forms of these molecules. Now, Free amino acids, you're going to have different charges. And that's why we, we see cysteine, tyrosine, and I'm surprised that serine's not on this list. Again, those two amino acids, if they have a pH that, ver or sorry, if they have an ionizable side chain or ionizable R group, it's not really going to be what you see in a polypeptide. So that's one of the reasons that we don't really talk about those two. Um, but as free amino acids, they're a little bit more ionizable. Okay. So the structure is going to change based on the pH. So that's why we get a titration curve. Here's the titration curve for the amino acid alanine. What you should see and what I want you to take away is that this is showing us the different forms and where they are common. 
So this cationic form and this anionic form, those are going to be kind of the bookends. The cation is going to be the most common form up until you hit the first pKa. And as soon as you hit the first pKa, so at pKa1, I'll say, you're gonna have an equal concentration. So when the pH is equal to pKa1, you're gonna have an equal concentration of the cation and the zwitterion. At pKa2, you're gonna have an equal concentration of the zwitter ion and the anion form. Above pKa2, the anion is going to be the predominant form. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that this point right here, a PI, also known as the isoelectric point. The isoelectric point is where 100% of the molecule is the Zwitter ion form, 100%. How do you calculate, or what is the PI? Well, what you do to calculate a PI is you take PK1, add that to pK2, and you divide it by two. So you can see a PI and say, all right, well, that's approximately, let's call it 6.2. Just That's just an eyeball animation. If we had our two pKa's of, you know, pK1 is, let's call that 2.2, pK2 is 9.9 9 .9 or something like that. Well, that'd be 9.9 .9 plus 2.2 .2 divided by two. And that would be approximately 6.05. And that kind of aligns with my eyeball estimation of the PI. But the way that you calculate a PI is by taking those two pKa's that surround this point right here. And we say, all right, well, when fifth, we take those two pKa's, add them up, divide by two, and that's where 100% of our molecule is our square eye. Histidine, it's a little bit trickier. Histidine is a triprotic amino acid. As a triprotic amino acid, it has one, two, three pKa's. How do you figure out the... How do you figure out the PI? Well, you got to remember the charges. And if we look at this Zwitter ion, we have one positive charge, one negative charge. This PI or isoelectric point is where 100% of the molecule is our Zwitter ion and 100% has a zero charge. If it has a positive charge, that positive charge is counterbalanced by a negative charge. Okay. So basically, you know, the way that I like to do this is I like to think about the range of charges that a molecule can have. If we look at alanine, it can be plus one and it transitions from positive one to zero and it transitions from, uh, from zero to negative one. How does it do that? Well, we take pK1, pK2 as our transition points. Now here, what we've got is, well, we've got pK1, we've got pK2, pK3. We do not, take all three pKa's and divide by two. We do not take all three pKa's, divide by three. Instead, what we do is we say the PI or the isoelectric point is where 100% of our molecule has zero charge whatsoever. So now if we go back, we look at plus one to zero to minus one. 
we are looking at what are the pKa's that show us a transition from plus one to zero and that show us a transition from zero to minus one. That's what we care about. So let's come back here and let's think about the possible charges that histidine can have. Now I'm gonna use this model right here as a model of histidine that I'm going to manipulate. I added this H here to so histidine when it is fully protonated. When histidine is fully protonated, it has a neutral charge on the C termini. It's got a positive charge on the N termini and a positive charge on the R group. So that means that histidine has a charge of plus two. Now the first group to be deprotonated is the group that I just erased that hydrogen from, the carboxyl. And I know that just because I've known these pKa's for a long time, but this is approximately 2.2. This is about 6.1. Let's call this 9.5. You have to know the pKa's and I will give you those pKa's, but you have to know kind of, you have to be thinking about, all right, what am I doing? What group am I deprotonating from first? And one thing that's really important to think about is you're going to deprotonate a group. And then when you've completely deprotonated that group, then and only then will you move on to deprotonate the next group. So an important thing to, to note is that this group, the amino group and the carboxyl group will never be deprotonated. And this R group remain protonated. Because the sequence is, we're going to deprotonate the first pKa, or the group of the lowest pKa. And then we're going to move on to deprotonate the next group with the second lowest pKa. Then and only then will we move on to deprotonate our third group, which has our highest pKa. Okay, so We'll line up our groups we'll say, all right, well, when our first group is deprotonated at uh, the lowest pKa, that means our molecule will have a plus one charge because we've lost that hydrogen from our carboxylic acid. Then when we deprotonate our next group, we're going to go from plus one to zero. Then when we deprotonate our third and final group, we're going to go from zero to negative one. So when every group has been deprotonated, then and only then will you have a molecule with a minus one charge. Now, if I were to make some estimations based on the, the model here, 1.9, 6.1, or actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna use the numbers that I wrote up here. Forget this, going back to my, my pKa values. And I'm gonna do it right. Okay, so histidine, on this table has three pKa's, 1.77, that corresponds to my alpha carboxyl group. The amino group is 9.18, and then the side chain is 6.10. So we're going to, the sequence that histidine is going to be deprotonated is gonna get deprotonated here, then here, and then here. Now I'm gonna write these down on a separate piece of paper for myself, 1.77, 6.1, and 9.18. And now we're gonna jump back ahead. So these numbers, that's where they're coming from. And I need to, you know, I drew the, I wrote these numbers in earlier and I should have just gone back, but now I will put the correct ones in. So 1.77, 6.10 and 9.18. Okay, so pK1 is 1.77, pK2 is 6.10, and 3 is 9.18. Now, you have to know where the different pKa values are assigned. So if I gave you that table, you gotta be able to say, all right, I know enough about this molecule to know that this group is deprotonated, then this group, then this group. Now, if I wanna calculate my PI, like I said previously, I don't need all three of these pKa values. 
if we use alanine as our model, we only need the pKa values to the left of zero and to the right of zero. So for these two pKa values, or for the two, for the pI calculation, we need 6.10, 9.18. So 6.10 plus 9.18 divided by two equals, and clear that, that, use my phone calculator, 6 point plus 9.18 divided by two, and I get a PI of 7.64. So that is the, if I adjusted my mole, or if I adjusted the solution to a pH of 7.4, 100% of the molecule would have a charge of zero. Now, what's important to know about that is what would that look like? If my pH is 7.4, 100% of the molecule looks like this, 7.64. Now, the significance of that, well, the significance is that that is a point where your molecule is least Soluble. What that means is that molecule will precipitate out of solution. So we have that isoelectric point where our positive and negative charges cancel one another out, and no other groups are going to be, uh, uh, no other groups have a charge on them. Now, in this case, the sequence that we deprotonated was C termini, R group, N termini. That's not always the case. If we look at, for example, oopsies, arginine. Arginine, the first group that we deprotonate would be the C termini, then the N termini, then our R group. So just be careful and thoughtful when you're looking at this table, which group is going to be deprotonated first, which is second, which is third. Now, it's pretty safe to say that, or yeah, it's absolutely safe to say, your C termini will always be deprotonated first, but then it's either the side chain or the end termini. So you need to know that and be able to decipher that to kind of proceed. All right, so, there we go, there's our, our histidine titration curve. Now, this is just another example of how to calculate and calculating uh, and drawing in your different curves or drawing in different things. I'll give you a, a, so I like to ask questions of, uh, about overall charges. I like to ask questions about what form of the molecule is most common at this pH. So then whenever you're thinking about that, you gotta be thinking about different, uh, um, sorry, whenever you're looking at that sort of thing and answering that sort of question, you have to just be thoughtful of, okay, well, is my pH higher than this pK? Is it higher than this pK? Which pKs is it higher than or lower than? Now, just as that happens to individual amino acids, that also happens to polypeptides. Polypeptides have multiple ionizable groups, which affect their overall structure and chemical properties. In peptides, the pKa of the free carboxyl is about three and a half. pKa of the free amino is about 8.5. So there's our, our different groups. Now, as you can see here, just as we can, or as you can see with this, I like that, you, or I like to think that you can imagine, well, if we can calculate a PI for an amino acid, we can also do it for a peptide. You're absolutely right. Now, with that in mind, we've got these groups right here. So alanine doesn't have an ionizable site, uh, doesn't have an ionizable C termini, just as glutamate does not have an ionizable N-termini. We don't care about those. So 
when you're doing a calculation of a PI, you do not need to integrate those as a part of your calculation. So what is the, and looking at this sort of molecule, what is the overall charge as it's drawn? Well, we've got a positive charge at the end termini. We have a negative charge for glutamates, R group. We have a positive charge for lysine, and we have a negative charge for the C termini. What I like to do with this sort of thing is I like to draw out or list out my pKa values in sequence from the lowest to the highest. 3.5, 4.3, and 10.5. If I want to look at my charges, positive, negative, those cancel, positive, negative. So as it's drawn, the overall charge is zero. Now, if I gave you this molecule and I said, at what pH is this molecule drawn? That's a little bit of a tricky question, but I know that you can do it. Why do I know that you can do it? Well, because you know that if pH is greater than the pKa, that group is deprotonated. Okay. So let's look at our different groups. The N termini, our pKa of 8.5, that's protonated. So what does that say about our pH? That says that our pH is less than 8.5. Okay, what about glutamate? pKa of 4.3, is our pH greater than or less than that? Well, the group is deprotonated, therefore our pH is above that. Now from for looking at these other two, a pKa of 10.5. Well, if our pH is less than 8.5, it's also less than 10.5. So I'm gonna cross that out. And then the last one, pKa of 3.5, if our pH is greater than 4.3, then it's also greater than 3.5. So what this tells us is that our pH is somewhere within this region. It's between 4.3 and 8.5. The pH is not 8.6, it's not four. It's greater than 4.3 and less than 8.5, based on how this molecule is drawn. There we go. So what can you do with charge information? You can calculate the net charge at a specific pH. You can determine the pH range based on a given structure. And you can calculate the peptide of a sample peptide. Now, the name of this molecule, three-letter code is right there. One-letter code is also right there. We've got. From the N termini, we have a glutamine, followed by a histidine, followed by a leucine, followed by a lysine. PKA of these different groups from the N termini is 8.5. The R group for histidine is six. As And we're just gonna use the information that's on this slide rather than that previous table. Um, and I'm saying that just because I will always provide you with PKA. The R group for lysine is 10.5, and the C is 3.5. Do we care about the R group for glutamine? No, it's not ionizable. What about leucine? Not ionizable. So ultimately, what we've got is if our pH was 5, what would that mean? Well, that would mean that that group is protonated, that this group, I'm just going to use checks to indicate protonated. Protonated, 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 and then an X to denote deprotonated. You got to know, though, if a group is protonated, is it a positive charge or is it neutral? Well, the end term and I, it's going to be positive. Histidine, if it's protonated, it's positive. Lysine, if it's protonated, it's positive. And our C termini, if that's deprotonated, that would be a negative. So we've got a charge of plus two because we have three groups that are protonated, one that is deprotonated, and the one that is deprotonated brings a negative charge now. So our net charge for that molecule is plus two. Our pH as this molecule is drawn is somewhere between 3.5 and six. 
And if you know that, or sorry, let me, the last item is what about our PI? Well, when it comes to PI calculations, I think the best thing to do is to again, list out your PKA values in increasing order. 3.5, 6, 8.5, 10.5. If every single one of these groups was protonated, so at the lowest possible pH, so if the pH was below 3.5, what would the overall charge on this molecule be? It would be plus 3. Okay. Now, the plus three is going to transition to plus two. And where is it going to do that? As soon as our pH is above six, that's going to transition to plus one. Plus one is going to transition to zero. And zero is going to transition to minus one. So looking at this molecule, could this molecule, this peptide, ever have a plus four charge? No, it cannot. Could this molecule ever have a minus two charge? No, it could not. What's the PI of this molecule? Well, what are the two pKa values to the left and the right of our zero charge? 8.5 and 10.5. Add those up, you get 19. 19 divided by two, 9.5. There you go. So next up, isoelectric point. So we already kind of looked at calculating our molecule where it has no overall charge. Easy way to calculate PI. And actually, sorry, let me go back. This is showing on the right hand side the different kind of or a spectrum of our molecule. This is these kind of lima bean shaped structures. That's a, any generic random protein. At a high pH, that protein is going to be soluble. At a high pH, a basic pH, everything's going to be deprotonated. Now, at a low pH below that, so I was just talking about this model right here. At a low pH right here, everything's going to have a positive charge. The environment's going to be positively charged because it's an acidic environment. And you know what? Everything's going to remain soluble. In the upper right-hand corner, what do we have? We have our molecule has an overall charge of zero. What's going to happen is our molecule or our protein is going to aggregate. The number of positive charges and negative charges completely cancel one another out. Positive charge finds a negative charge, stable. Negative charge finds a positive charge, stable. And that's what's going to happen leading to our protein aggregating and being at its least soluble point. So this graph in the lower right-hand corner shows us solubility of a protein. Highly soluble at a low pH. It's also highly soluble at a high pH. Easy way to calculate this, net charge for a pH, or pH range that brackets each pKa value. Identify the pKa values that result in the transition from positive one to zero and a zero to minus one charge. Use these two pKa values to calculate PI. So one half times pKi plus pKj, or those two pKa values, is the same as pK1 plus pKa2 divided by two. So histidine, here are example pKa values. We see that the pKa values that we care about are six and 9.5 because of our net charges. 9.5 plus six is 15 divided by two is seven. Is 15.5 divided by two is 7.75. Here's another example where you've got basically, actually, we already did that one. That's just represented again. And here is pKa values or designated pKa values. And that's that's exactly what we got. 8.5 plus 10.5 divided by two is 9.5. So um, this is just more of a, a look at every individual ionizable group within a peptide. 
and calculating a PI. So if you had something like this, if our pH was below 3.5, our carboxylic acid is neutral. Anytime our pH is above 3.5, it's going to be negative. I would never expect you to uh, reproduce a table like this, but I think that this is a good way of looking at each ionizable group independently. Histidine at a low pH, at a pH of below six, it's going to be positively charged. pH above six, it's going to be neutral. Does histidine ever adopt a negative charge? It does not. Could histidine ever be plus two? It cannot. Um, it, sorry, histidine within a polypeptide. This is what we're looking at is this table is a representation of the previous model. So we've got ultimately looking at possible charges within a molecule. What does that mean for the net charge of the molecule? Estimations, information that you do need to know. This will be helpful in the next, uh, with the next lecture. Uh, the average formula weight of an amino acid is approximately 110 Daltons, which is the same as 0 0.110 kilodaltons. So if you know how many amino acids that a, a polypeptide is or a protein is, then you can calculate in Daltons or in kilodaltons the molecular weight of a protein. So if something's 250 amino acids long or 250 residues, it's approximately 110 Daltons or 27,500 Daltons or 27.5 kilodaltons. You should also be able to go in the opposite direction. If a protein has a mass of 32,450 Daltons or 32.45 kilodaltons, divide that by 110, you realize that this protein is 295 residues long. And that's going to wrap up everything or our intro to uh, amino acids. Um, this is a lot of information, and there's you know there's a there's a ton here, but there are some kind of foundational skills that if you feel good about the water lecture, that's going to put you in a good position because that's all about ionization. Treat amino acids not as some radically different molecule. If the pH of a solution is below the pKa, then that group is going to be protonated. Um, if the pH is above it, then that group's going to be deprotonated. Now, if you have any questions about this information, please let me know. I'd be glad to help you out. Other than that, I hope you